Hey everyone, welcome back to another Hardware News Recap for the week. We've just finished up four CP reviews of the entire AMD Ryzen 5000 series so far. So we've got the 5950X all the way down to the 5600X. All those reviews are online already. Now we're going to recap some of the news. We have one major story on NVIDIA and uh, MSRP targets for partners, which are apparently very difficult to reach on the next series of NVIDIA GPUs. And the Ryzen 5000 availability discussion, we'll be talking about PCI SIG and the PCIe 6.0 specification, finally entering uh, a, a state closer to getting finished. Arctic's new 420 liquid cooler, the Liquid Freezer 2 420 version has just come out, and a couple of other stories. Before that, this video is brought to you by EK Water Blocks, and it's RTX 30 series vector water blocks. EK Quantum Vector Blocks include options for Founders Edition 3080 and 3090 cooling, Asus Tough and Strix 3080 blocks, EVGA XC3 and FTW3 blocks, and more. EK has Blackout, Acrylic, and RGB blocks available, including new Special Edition blocks with minimalistic aesthetics. Learn more at the link in the description below. So first up, just in case you didn't notice it, we did publish all the reviews back to back. The reason we're mentioning it again here is just because, depending on how YouTube might have served those reviews to you, you might not know they're up. But we do have the 5950X review, the 5900X review, the 5600X review, and the 5800X review live on the channel. We also did about a four and a half hour live stream overclocking the 5950X. And uh, we might work on a separate recap of that because we did some precision boost to scaling versus temperature from 80 degrees above, M above zero all the way down to minus 60 or so to see how the frequency scaled. And it kept scaling up all the way down into the negatives for temperature. So we might talk about that more, but end of the day, we did about 5.6 gigahertz all core for the 5950X before we started having condensation buildup issues and had to just break it down for the night. Uh, but we'll revisit soon we were using an X570 Hero Dark that worked really well. Uh, it's just we ran into some condensation buildup from the duration of the stream. So uh, all the parts are good to go, and I think we can hit maybe a 5.8 on that CPU if we try again. OK, first major story, partners on NVIDIA MSRP Target. First off, throughout this story, we'll probably be showing some factory tour footage we used of just factories that manufacture different uh, cooling components and have different machine shops in play for the PC hardware industry. None of those necessarily have any connection to the story as we're going to be presenting it. We just need some B-roll to, to uh, give you some context to what we're talking about. So this one is about one of NVIDIA's next upcoming GPUs. Technically, it doesn't have a, a firm name yet. There are some rumors out there lately of 30, 60 type class parts, but we don't have a firm name yet. What we do have is a target price level. We're being told that NVIDIA is trying to hit an RTX 2060 to maybe GTX 1660 Ti class of price, that'd be somewhere in the range of $250 to $300 MSRP for the customer. And uh, what we've been told by board partners is that the current MSRP is unrealistic to hit while still providing a baseline quality, at least mostly good card, as in cooler plus PCB, to complement the GPU and the memory that NVIDIA sells to the partners. And so we're going to talk through how things work from a perspective of how NVIDIA works with the partners. We talked to them, got the cost of like the BOM, the bill of materials cost for several of the coolers on the market. We can't give the specifics on which coolers we're talking about, but we can kind of aggregate them and give you an idea of high-end, mid-range, low-end GPU coolers, what those actually cost versus what NVIDIA is allegedly requesting its partners to budget for those coolers. They're telling us it's very low. And then we also, because we recognize that partners also have a motive and potential bias here, we also reached out to some of our contacts at factories in China to ask them about their experience with the manufacturing costs since they're the ones actually supplying the coolers to the companies that are putting them on the cards. So early on in the process, a couple months ahead of launch, partners start getting a technical specs document from NVIDIA and it details recommended or suggested pricing allowances and budgets for different parts of the video card. Those are typically broken up into PCB and PCB often includes the VRM, depends some of the partners split it out separately, but PCB will be one cost. You have cooler as one cost, which includes the backplate, the shroud, the heatsink fan solution. And then you have GPU and memory costs, which is a fixed cost from NVIDIA, and a couple of other costs associated with it, like manufacturing and assembly cost. So early on, NVIDIA will give the partners a sheet, which they can reference for, here's how much we think you should budget for your heatsink fan 
and for the PCB in order to hit this MSRP of whatever it is, let's say $300 in an instance like this one. Partners generally know better than Nvidia or AMD what the appropriate bomb costs are for each of these components, but AMD and Nvidia try to help well ahead of launch anyway because they don't normally lock down the final pricing of the, as in the cost of the GPU and memory for the partners until closer to production, which is largely to control leaks. And so the partners are kind of flying blind here, where a lot of the time they don't know the MSRP of the cards until much before we do. And in some cases, they know at the same time we do, which is when Jensen goes on stage for a major flagship announcement. Of course, the biggest cost is always GPU and memory, which are sold as a bundled package to the partners by NVIDIA. It's possible for partners to source their own memory supply, at least in the past, but because the volume is so much lower than crowdsourcing it through the GPU maker, it's typically bundled together and sold all in one. This also helps NVIDIA obscure the true GPU silicon cost since it's harder to separate the combined price. But uh, sometimes the super high-end cards might specify a type of memory and the memory supplier. So if, say, Samsung or Micron's better for a particular generation, they might go and try and source that on their own. Currently, NVIDIA's goal is to try and hit an MSRP of $250 to $300, allegedly at least from the partners, and this is predicated on the usage of a GPU heatsink fan that costs somewhere between $4 and $5 for the bill of materials cost. Now, $4 and $5, that range, we've received the, the firm pricing for that, but we've obfuscated a little bit so NVIDIA can't figure out uh, which partners are talking to us because they might give them different dollars and cents values to try and isolate leaks. So it's between four and five-ish is what we'll say. And for perspective, uh, a stock CPU cooler, like an Intel stock cooler solution, that's commonly called a flower style design in the GPU world. You'll see those sometimes on like the $100 to $150 class cards where it's basically an Intel stock cooler with a fan strapped to it and that's more or less all the cooler is. That is closer to the range that NVIDIA is suggesting for the heatsink fan cost, which would include the shroud and the branding as well. And the branding, by the way, NVIDIA has a lot of requirements for where RTX and GeForce need to be present on the card, how they need to be presented, uh, whether or not it can be removable. They used to allow stickers and they've kind of moved away from that. Although some companies like Asus are getting clever with separate plates that you can remove so they're not technically stickers. So all this stuff factors into the cost. And we were told by partners that their high-end models, often just below the flagship or right around the flagship, cost around $40 to $50 for the cooling solution. That includes the backplate, the shroud, the RGB LEDs, the thermal pads. This cost can be high if using good pads in a lot of them. The uh, metal fin stack, the paste, any present vapor chambers if they're there, and the tooling, and of course the heat pipes for uh, part of the heatsink as well. Specifically, the tooling cost is what balloons the total cooler cost, but more on that in a moment. A low-end cooler, as found in existing GTX 1650 class GPUs, costs about $9 for the absolute cheapest ones on the market, and that's the bill of materials cost, with a $13 bomb cost for the high-end GTX 1650 cards. For perspective, a $9 GPU cooler doesn't usually cool the memory or the VRM, and if it does, it doesn't cool them well, and it only cools the GPU. Board partners explained to us that the lower-end cards might make them $1 profit here and there, but otherwise, it was described by one partner as a, quote, Wild West for the low-end cart. It's hard to even say what the margins are because they're always on and off promotions and don't have a strict MSRP, so it's more fluid, end quote. The bomb cost provided to GN by partners includes the thermal pads, the screws, sometimes the LEDs, the shroud, the backplate, which is about a $1 cost for an aluminum backplate, the fans, and the heat sink. The fans cost about $1 to $1.40 each for PWM cost with custom blades, and that's, again, cost to the partner, whereas a low-end PC case fan might cost 70 cents, but the better ones are in the $1 to $2 range for PWM fans that are actually good. None of these companies include the PCB or assembly cost in this cooler cost number we're quoting, so there are a lot more costs associated, logistics and shipping, another major one for devices this heavy that need to be shipped fast. For perspective though, assembly on an RTX 2060 class GPU with a mid-range cooler is typically in the range of $14. This relates to assembly and often to tooling, depending on how the partner splits out their costs. Sometimes tooling is counted towards the cooler cost, and often it's counted towards the manufacturing cost, but it's ultimately divided out against the order quantity. So getting all of this information, we then obviously ask the partners, 
so what is it you want from us? What is it you're expecting? What's your goal in sharing this information? And the answer was that they want NVIDIA to either set a higher MSRP that's more realistic and closer to what the cards will actually be selling for, especially after the first couple days of launch where the MSRP products appear and vanish forever after that. Uh, or they want NVIDIA to take a margin cut and sell the GPU and the RAM to partners for cheaper, big surprise, so that they can more easily hit MSRP. Now, this obviously indicates a potential separate motive for the partners. So we did reach out to some factories in China to get further discussion from a third party. That way we can try and figure out what sort of uh, quality of information we're getting from everyone in the chain. So partner motive here does benefit the customer by way of seeking pressure on NVIDIA to bring the MSRP either up so that it's more realistic and fair, or bring the margin down so that the product is cheaper ultimately. But it does benefit the partner enough that we asked around. So our understanding is that after speaking with factories, the cooler bomb prices quoted to GN from board partners have to include tooling costs divided out by the total number of products in almost all instances. Tooling can easily cost tens of thousands of dollars depending on the amount of pre-production tools that are being made, how many tools, and it's a major investment. The tools are reusable basically forever, at least for as long as the life of these relatively shortly lived products, but their high cost means volume production is needed to make up for the cost. Tools are what's installed in the large stamp machines and the other machines that we've shown in our factory tours. Cooling factories think that the price of four to five dollars isn't realistic once you get into territory of a dual fan GPU cooler, unless they remove the back plate they reduce the fin density of the cooler and thus the cooling capabilities. They reduce the heat pipe count or remove most of the heat pipes. They use less copper and they use cheaper interfaces and then four to five dollars is more realistic. So all of this to say, we then looped back with the partners with this new information and we uh, asked a few questions and we're told that the partners basically as of right now will have to do things like offer mail and rebates in order to hit the NVIDIA MSRP on this upcoming product, which is yet unnamed. Uh, and the reason that this works, specifically mail-in rebates, is we were told that mail-in rebates have a redemption rate of about 30 to 40%. So a $20 mail-in rebate is really only reducing the effective global cost or retail price of the card by about $7 per unit, if you split the difference there, as opposed to $20 per unit, if you do the math against all of the sales when assuming a 35% redemption rate of mail-in rebates. So uh, ultimately, it sounds like tricks will be played with MDF and uh, rebates and other promotions in order to hit MSRP. It sounds like you might see cards for the next one that are commonly above MSRP, whether that's 20 or $30. We're not clear, but 20 or 30 would be enough to make up that cost difference, assuming they're willing to take a, a margin cut, the partners that is. And we'll have to follow up after launch to see if NVIDIA ended up changing its price to benefit the partners or changing its margin to benefit the consumers. And um, of course, a lot of this will also hinge on whether NVIDIA decides to make its own Founders Edition model. It, it might not, but if it does, then there's a little bit motive, more motive here for why it might be recommending unrealistic MSRPs for the partners. So one of the quotes we were given closing this out was, if we sold only that, the MSRP price cards, we'd be bankrupt. One contact told us, saying that the current guidelines from NVIDIA uh, aren't feasible. Next story, Ryzen 5000 availability. We're going to keep this one really short. So uh, as expected, Ryzen 5000 sold out right away. The main thing we're keeping short is a uh, discussion of quantity because we don't, we don't know. We don't know how many were shipped or in relation to the Ryzen 3000 shipments, how many there were. So it would just be speculation. The only thing that I am setting time aside for in this video for is the conspiracies we've seen where people think that this is some fast fashion styled false scarcity to make it look like there's this ravenous interest in a product. So first of all, AMD already had ravenous interest in the product. It was already unhealthy interest. Uh, you can look a few months ago to see, you can look a decade ago and see that. So they don't need that. They, they don't need help in creating like rabid fan interest in their products. They've already got that down pretty well. And secondly, it makes absolutely zero sense to launch a product, like a piece of silicon product, and intentionally create scarcity. It does not make sense. You would make less money. If you're leaving customers at the door of your establishment with money in their hand and telling them we don't have any, that's not benefiting you. 
especially because this isn't like fast fashion or something. It's a functional product that has long-term value and it has a shelf life. CPUs and GPU silicon, the companies, they'll dump upwards of a billion dollars into an architecture and they need to start recouping that money as soon as the product is ready because it's got a short time where it will be a relevant product before it's outpaced either by a competitor or by another team at the company that is making the current product being sold. So the companies, NVIDIA and AMD, aren't necessarily, well, NVIDIA is potentially a different story with competition, but AMD certainly isn't, it, it doesn't benefit from creating false scarcity. They can only make money on their product if they actually have it to sell. So just wanted to address that really weird conspiracy theory. The demand is in fact high. Supply, don't know. We don't know on the Ryzen 5000 series. We haven't really talked to many people yet. It could be lower than normal. It could be normal. It could be higher than normal. Doesn't matter. End of the day, a lot of people want the thing because it's good. And so the accessibility to the product will be low. And that's just how things are right now. But uh, false scarcity, especially when you're talking to shareholders involved with a company that size, it doesn't make sense. So we wanted to address that. And one final note on this too, with everybody doing work from home, learning from home, stuff like that right now, you suddenly have families that have had an old system they haven't need to update because the, the parents can maybe use a computer at work. They don't really need something at home. Uh, kids can use computers at school. Now you have people who are fighting for access over what might be the only computer in the house, especially if you think outside of our audience, outside of the enthusiast space. Everyone's buying computers and tablets and laptops and everything because suddenly everyone in the household needs one in order to do school and work. And suddenly you've got more engineering work being done from home as well. So high-end parts are selling out. So this is more than just like AMD is trying to make it look like their products in super high demand. And so they are somehow limiting the supply so that they can make more money it doesn't it doesn't work all right pci sig releasing pcie 6.0 specification version 0 0.7 a uh, quick update on the brewing pcie gen 6 spec as the pci sig has officially released its pcie 6.0 version 0 0.7 to its members and this should be the last milestone ahead of full ratification for 2021 although there will be a version 0 0.9 before ultimately hitting a version 1.0 on the Gen 6 spec, as this version has finalized bandwidth, electrical specifications, uh, signaling, things like that. PCIe Gen 6 will double the previous Gen 5 bandwidth. PCIe will continue to rely on PAM4 signaling, and uh, PCIe Gen 6 will also make use of low latency forward uh, error correction, or FEC, and will be fully backwards compatible all the way back to PCIe Gen 1.x up through 5.0. And if you're saying, why is this happening? There's not even PCIe Gen 5 and motherboards yet. It's because the group that ratifies the specification for the interface has to do so far ahead of manufacturing ever starting. And even in a lot of cases before, the silicon companies really have something underway that's going to use that spec because obviously it needs to be finalized before it can get deployed. So you'll see the interface organizations like USBIF, for example, start ratifying their spec long ahead of, of launch because that's just that's how it works. You need the spec in order to incorporate it into the product. Bear in mind that like DRAM, interface and bus technologies also have a, a long gestation period. PCI SIG released the final 5.0 spec uh, in May of 2019 and consumers won't see PCIe 5.0 capable hardware until at least second half of 2021. Next one, one of the more interesting pieces of hardware we've looked at recently that's not a CPU or a GPU has been the Arctic Liquid Freezer series. So EK's AIO, Arctic's Liquid Freezer, and actually another upcoming cooler that we've tested but we haven't published a review on yet, uh, all three of those have sort of changed the game of closed-loop liquid cooling performance as compared to the older Tech models that have been stuck on the same general design for a couple of of generations, a couple of years now actually. So uh, the Liquid Freezer 2 is working with a 420 millimeter closed loop liquid cooler now. So uh, larger radiator size, it will accompany the same pump. And as we understand it, other than tube length and radiator size, most of the rest of the specs should be the same. One thing we're interested to see, and we do have these in for testing, but I haven't worked on the, the LF2 420 yet. One thing we're interested in testing is how well the pump is putting up with that extra tube length 
and radiator size. Because in the past, some of the CLCs or the AIOs that have been in the 420 sizing have suffered from a more anemic pump as compared to the size, where those pumps will do really well at 280, 360. And once you hit the sizes larger than that, they can start having a pretty serious performance fall off. Now, last time we saw that was with an Alpha Cool old, old CLC that was semi open. So not only did it have a weaker pump, but it also had impedance in the way of QDCs in the hoses, one on each side. But we'll be looking at that. This is heavily requested by you all, for those of you who've already seen the 420 millimeter announcement, and uh, we'll be testing it soon. It's interesting that Arctic is adding a 420 millimeter sized radiator for this. There aren't a whole lot of CLCs or AIOs larger than 360 out there. Uh, and even with open loop, a lot of the time people will just go to multi-radiator, so two 240s or something instead. Uh, so we're looking forward to testing it. And with the Ryzen 5950X, for example, we probably would have been able to hold a slightly higher, maybe 50 megahertz higher clock in overclocking if we had a larger radiator. So there's potentially value there. Arctic is still touting its use of in-house developed uh, pump and fan solutions, which you can learn about in our Liquid Freezer 2 teardown video. And uh, the pricing is supposed to be $140. It will have three 140 mil fans, uh, MX4 thermal compound for the cold plate, and the EU pricing is currently at 120 euros. Up next, AMD X86 market share numbers for third quarter of 2020. As usual, this is provided by Mercury Research. Mercury Research currently is showing the AMD X86 market share numbers as boosted to some of the highest levels uh, since 2007 at this point. These numbers represent quarter three of 2020. They were taken before the Ryzen 5000 CPU launch as a result. And uh, it ends up showing a 22.4% x86 market share as a whole for AMD at present. For AMD, this is an increase of 4.1 points over quarter two for 2020 and 6.3 points for quarter three of 2019, so year over year increase. In the x86 desktop space, AMD is showing its 12th consecutive quarter of growth with a 0.9 points quarterly increase bringing them to 20.1% of the desktop market. This is a 2.1 point increase year over year. And for notebooks, AMD broke its record for notebook market share now at 28.2%. This is up from the previous record for AMD of 19.9%, which was quarter two of 2020. This is impressive growth for AMD, which now has its strongest presence in the desktop space since 2013, and its largest presence in the overall x86 market, again, since 2007. The server market, as usual, is a little bit muddier because depending on which research outlet you go with, it's collected in a different way. AMD historically has based its share number for server on IDC's research, and that only captures the 1P and 2P market for server setups whereas Mercury Research captures all x86 class servers. So big difference there. That said, Mercury shows AMD sitting at 6.6% of the server market, and that marks a 0.8 point increase quarter over quarter and a 2.3 point increase year over year. Next up is Massachusetts expanding its right to repair laws. This isn't strictly computer hardware news, but it is related because right to repair is an important issue in computer hardware as well and consumer technology and is likely something you've heard us mention a, a couple of times in the past. This story comes to us from iFixit, and uh, it reports on Massachusetts having long been a battleground for right to repair. In fact, Lewis Rossman on his YouTube channel has talked about some of the issues relating to this. So this one was uh, relating back to the 2012 Massachusetts right to repair legislation that gave way to the Motor Vehicle Owner's Right to Repair Act, which eventually forced the automobile industry and its various coalitions and organizations to sign a memorandum of understanding which acknowledged that the companies, the industry, would support the law in all 50 states. Now, in the face of personal and telemetry-related data on drivers generated by their cars, Massachusetts just passed a very important new law. It's Question 1, or the Right to Repair Law, and it's for Vehicle Data Access Requirement Initiatives, stating that independent repair shops are permitted to access the wirelessly transmitted repair and diagnostic data that has been generated and funneled directly to manufacturers for several years now. This is a new law that is set to take effect with the model year 2022 vehicles. iFixit CEO commented on this saying, quote, modern cars can send maintenance information directly to the manufacturers, cutting out local mechanics. Question one, make sure that consumers can continue to fix their own vehicles or get them fixed 
at the shop of their choice, end quote. The war over data generated by cars has been brewing for some time now, and it's the typical trope of privacy versus money. Car makers want to control and monetize the data, looking for another avenue to make a profit, and privacy and right to repair advocates obviously take issue with that. So this new law could help galvanize another nationwide effort to crack open car data and uh, pry it away from manufacturers. Separately though, it could have a knock-on effect for digital and computer hardware, consumer electronics device, right to repair laws, which are constantly uh, in flux. And another important thing for, for example, smartphones, consoles, and laptops. ARM recently took the wraps off of what we believe is its first CPU aimed directly at laptops, the ARM Cortex A78C. This comes during Apple's transition to custom ARM silicon and an increasing interest from Microsoft and its Windows 10 on ARM systems. ARM suggested that it was looking to get into x86 with x86 competing offerings when it announced its Cortex-X custom program and the Cortex-X1. The CXC and X1 are born out of the idea of building chips beyond ARM's traditional ecosystem and PPA or performance per area requirements, building custom chips that are scalable to different form factors and larger devices, again, to compete with devices that are traditionally in x86 territory. While the Cortex A78C CPU itself isn't derived from CXC, rather it's a derivative of ARM's most recent Cortex A series IP, it demonstrates that ARM seems serious about punching ever higher with its compute performance. The ARM Cortex A78 supported four big cores and four little cores, and you may have seen the all caps big dot little marketing and branding relating to this. And now the Cortex A78C will support eight of the larger cores in what it's calling just an octa-core CPU. The Cortex A78C continues ARM's heterogeneous multi-core computing trend with configurations scaling up to eight uh, big cores. And the Cortex A78C also uses a noticeably larger eight megabyte L3 cache, which will be aimed more at improving performance in specifically data dense applications. And now to talk about consoles. Console purchases will apparently be different this year, it looks like, or different this, this decade, since they're once every decade at this point. So due to increasing, uh, we'll stick with human malware risks, Sony has already stated that no PlayStation 5 consoles will be available in stores on launch day. Instead, it's basically be done entirely online this time. Best Buy has gone as far as not permitting customers in the store on launch day or throughout the holiday season to buy consoles in person. Instead, purchase will be online only for Best Buy and most of the other retailers. Customers will still be able to pick up the order curbside at some of these locations, and Target even beat Sony to the punch on this one, stating on Twitter that the new consoles would only be available in stores to fulfill online orders and pickups. Walmart also joined Best Buy in this practice, stating that its inventory of next-gen consoles will only be available online. We fully expect other retailers will commit to this in an attempt to avoid long lines and crowds during the current timing. If you insist on having a new console this year, just make sure you're planning accordingly. As for Microsoft and the Xbox Series S and X, which is still naming that is entirely too difficult to say and <laughs> back to back, uh, Microsoft has made no formal statement at the time of filming, but for Best Buy, Target, and Walmart, the policy will apply to both consoles regardless of whether the console makers have their own practices. Finally, much to the chagrin of Windows users who know what they're doing, Microsoft is continuing to try to kill the control panel. It seems Microsoft is set to kill a control panel and its menuing in favor of its settings app, and uh, we'll call it navigation, if you, if you can call the settings app navigation, in Windows 10. In the most recent October 2020 Windows update, it seems that clicking on the system setting within control panel will instead point users to the settings app. Microsoft is also taking measures to prevent previous shortcuts and workarounds for accessing retired control panel menus and pages. And for whatever reason, Microsoft has decided to dismantle the control panel menu piece by piece. And if preview builds are anything to go by, the programs and features page will be the next part of the control panel to get the ax. So very unfortunate for those of us who have known how to use Windows through the control panel for a long time, but it's going the way of the settings menus instead. That's it for this one. Thanks for watching. As always, subscribe for more. You can go to store.gamersnexus.net or patreon.com slash gamersnexus. Tell us that directly. We have a new patrons Ask GN up there that we posted a few days ago. You can get access to that through Patreon. We'll see you all next time.